Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Day One Worship on this 21st day of June, 2020. Just a couple of announcements for you before we get underway with our worship service today. In these extraordinary times, we continue to have to do things in extraordinary ways. And this includes having the annual congregational meeting to elect new elders and trustees. In your July Proclaimer, you will have the slate presented to you, and you will also have a ballot that you can fill out, a paper ballot, and mail back in. Or you will have an email that comes to you, and you simply need to vote via email to elect those individuals. And this will be our congregational meeting for the year. Again, this is not how we normally do things, but I think we have grown accustomed to doing things differently than we normally do them in all aspects of our lives. So please be looking for that near the end of the month. Also a reminder that we have lots of online content for you. The One Prez pod continues to go strong. You can find Stress to the Nines there. You can find the Sunday sermons. You can find the audio of Sunday School. You can also find uh, Tasha's and my weekly conversation called The Week, which comes out every Friday, as well as interviews with members and people affiliated with the church in the Get to Know series. So there's lots of different content there. I do encourage you to check that out. The church's Facebook page, the church's YouTube channel, all the various regular online platforms that we have grown so accustomed to in these times. Now, with all that in mind, let us prepare our hearts for the worship of Almighty God. Holy God, on this day, we pray once more for forgiveness for our sins. In particular, this day, we pray for forgiveness for the anger and hatred we carry towards other people, the rage that we feel inside of ourselves, the bitterness. We ask that you would help to transform us once more through the grace of Jesus Christ, that we might embody Christ's love for all those whom we meet. 
and in so doing, reflect the love that you have for us. On this day, repress our partisanship, our racial and ethnic strife, our failure to understand one another, and instead elevate the oneness that we share as your created people. Particularly, we pray for a spirit of unity and oneness throughout your church, amongst all Christians in this country and throughout the world, that we would be united in the love of Jesus Christ. Forgive us this day, transform us this day, and fill us with your grace once more this day, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, that brings us to our scripture reading for today. It comes to us from the Gospel according to Matthew, the very end, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. I invite you to listen for God's word. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, and baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Trinity. Of all the doctrines that we as Christians profess, the Trinity is amongst the most confounding. If you've been coming to church for a long time, you've heard this language your whole life. We believe in the Trinity, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If church is new to you, you hear these, la- these words and you think to yourself, wait a minute, aren't we monotheists? Don't we believe in one God? Why is all, their ta- all this talk about three Are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit three different things? Are they three in one? Are they one in three? How does this work? The questions around the Trinity can be very confusing. And if you are confused by them and want to learn more about the Trinity, then I would refer you to Tasha's Sunday School class, which will commence immediately following this worship service at 10 o'clock. Because I am not going to lead you through the nuances of Trinitarian theology. Instead... I'm going to try to help us get a big picture view of what the Trinity is through a story. As you know, this is called the Summer Stories series, where we take different stories and use those to talk about our faith and the various issues surrounding our faith. It's very difficult to tell a story that directly relates to my experience of the Trinity, at least one that I can put into words. So instead today, I'm going to tell you a story that I think can frame the Trinity for us in some fairly simple ways to help us get an understanding of what it means when we say we worship the triune God, when we say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are God and that they are one God. And our story begins quite some time ago in August of 2002. Tasha and I were living in Edinburgh, Scotland, and completing our year there. Since January, we had been working at a little church called St. Margaret's in the working-class neighborhood of Leith. The church where we served had had a Christian worshiping community there since 1100 A.D., because that's Europe. So if you've ever been to Europe and you've been into a church, you can bet that people have probably been worshiping on that spot For many, many years, this was definitely true for St. Margaret's Kirk. And so since we were leaving, they wanted to throw us a going away party, which was very sweet of them, but I have to admit also a little bit intimidating because they were throwing us a Kaylee. Now, a Kaylee here in America is usually the name of a teenage girl, but in Scotland, it is the name of a party, a very specific type of Scottish party. You wear a kilt if you are a man. You sing very specific songs. You listen to some poetry, often by Robert Burns. And then you dance. 
So as I was walking into the church hall that day, I was thinking several different things. First, I was hoping that my kilt was on correctly. Yes, indeed. I did wear a kilt. Was it mine? No, it was not. Was it borrowed? Yes, it was. Is there a picture of me in this kilt? Yes, there is, but it is safely tucked away in my house, and I'm not going to show it to any of you. So I did have my kilt on, and I also suspected that I would have to dance. Now, what I'm about to tell you may seem as obvious to you as me saying that I am bald, but I feel the need to disclose it anyway. I can't dance. I'm a terrible dancer. I have no idea how to make my body do what my mind thinks it should do. I've never been good at that sort of thing. I've never been good at hitting golf balls, hitting tennis balls, anything that requires any sort of basic coordination, not me. So dancing, suffice to say, is not in my wheelhouse. So here I go into the church hall wearing my Scottish skirt, ready to do potentially some dancing. And so the party gets underway, and there is singing, and there's laughing, and there's talking, and then the dancing begins. And almost immediately, I am pulled out onto the dance floor. At that point, I realize that the best thing to do is to just go with it. And so I start trying to do the best I can to follow the steps. But what was remarkable to me was to see the other people from the church dancing during the Cayley. Most of the people in St. Margaret's were elderly. I was used to seeing them sitting very still, sometimes walking, but never very fast. In this case, so many of them were moving effortlessly across the floor of the church hall. They were light on their feet. They were nimble. Many of them, especially the women, had very elegant motions as they went through the moves of the dance. And they all seemed to know it by heart. It was like as soon as the music started and the dances were coordinated to specific songs and most of those songs were very old. As soon as the music started, they just seamlessly slipped in to the moves that their bodies seemed to know almost instinctively. And so as I stumbled through the Cayley and swung myself around, I found myself being caught up in being a part of something that seemed so ingrained in the people around me. Their dancing was so elegant. So why am I talking about dancing when I'm so bad at it? Here's the reason. Since the beginning, churches and theologians have been trying to explain what it means to say that we believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in trying to explain it, they came up with this idea of a trinity, of three in one, one in three. One God united in three separate persons, three separate people united in one God, however you want to phrase it. And around the 7th century, they devised a Greek word that they thought would explain the trinity better than anything else they had come up with. And it is this word, perichoresis. That's the word, perichoresis. Now, I have slipped Greek into this sermon, and I apologize for it, but when I tell you what it means, it should be evident of why I did it. The word perichoresis, which was used to describe the way in which God relates to God's self, the way in which the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit work together, the word perichoresis, devised 1,300 years ago to explain this doctrine, means to dance around. To dance Deep in its bones, what the church has devised is a belief that there is a perfect dance in perpetual motion throughout all of creation. A dance in which the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit move in perfect complementary natures to each other. Their movements helping the others amplifying the others, elevating the others, each bringing their unique gifts and skills to elevate the work of the others. It is a harmony. It is a symphony. It is a dance, a perfect dance. And you and I, you and I, over the course of our lives, we get pulled onto that dance floor. And we are pulled onto it for the very first time, the very first moment that we are pulled onto the dance floor 
with this dance that's been going on throughout the centuries, the very first time is when those waters of baptism hit our head. Because here's the thing. There's a lot of passages in Scripture that point back to the idea of a trinity, but none of them, none of them has been, have been as influential and as powerful to the understanding of the trinity as this passage from Matthew. When Jesus sends his disciples out to make disciples of all the nations, whether they be Jewish or not, all the nations, and then to baptize those people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The waters of that baptism dripped over my forehead just as they ran down yours. And those same waters if they were Christian, ran down the foreheads of our great-grandparents, and if they were Christian, their great-grandparents, and so on and so forth back into history, baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And in that water, each of those people was pulled into a dance that is in perfect harmony and synchronization. And if we think about our lives, if we reflect on them, I believe and I hope that we can think of moments when we felt like we were in perfect harmony with the triune God who was dancing around us in that moment. Moments when worship was just so sublime that we felt ourselves elevated. Moments when we lost ourselves in prayer Moments when we understood something about faith for the very first time in our lives. Moments when we did something for somebody else that was so selfless, but yet so joyful for us. In those moments in our lives, we can feel ourselves on the dance floor, in the midst of the dance that is always ongoing the dance of Father and of Son and of Holy Spirit, the dance that created us, that shapes us, that forms us, that challenges us, that saves us, that, that calls us. This is the dance in which we participate, a dance that is inaugurated in our lives in those waters. Two years ago, Tasha and I were back in Scotland in the little tiny town of Plockton for our sabbatical. And we were out for a walk one evening and we passed the town hall. And in Scottish communities, the town hall is really a community center. It's not where legislation happens. It's where people come and they gather. And on this occasion, they had gathered for something unique. We heard music and we recognized it a little bit, so we stuck our heads in, and we saw some adults, and we saw a large group of teenagers. And what we understood very quickly was that the teenagers were being taught the dances of the Kaylee. Now, I would love to tell you that the teenagers seemed delighted to be there, but you either are a teenager or have met a teenager, and you know that's not true. But I'll tell you that as we stood there and as we watched and as the music played and the adults talked and demonstrated, you could start to see their feet move. You could start to see their hips sway. You could start to see their shoulders loosen. You could start to see tiny hints of a smile on some of their faces. And as we watched, we understood that the dance would go on, that another generation was learning it, ready for another church hall, another village hall, another Kaylee in the future, when the dance would manifest itself in perfect synchronization, perfect harmony, just as it had before. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, on this day, we pray for your presence and work in our lives. 
We pray that you would help us to experience and feel your presence, that you would give us the knowledge to know that it is there, and that you would empower and encourage us to seek you out, to do your work, and to be people of love. Certainly in this time, in this moment, in our lives and in our country, we need to be people of love, and we ask for your strength in doing this. Help us to love all whom we meet and all whom we see. Help us to love our neighbors. Help us to love ourselves. Help us to love our enemies. We know that this is hard work, but we know that in and through you, it can become true and good and powerful in this world. Help us to set aside our feelings of anger and fear, our frustrations, our instincts to demonize others, and instead help us to reach out with grace. Help us to show others the dance that you have taught us. O oh Lord, on this day we pray for all of those who are afflicted by illness, whether it be COVID-19 or illnesses that are rampant and wide in our world. And we take this time now to offer to you our prayers for particular people and situations. Lord, we pray for one another, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray that this community, this congregation, would remain strong and powerful through you. That we would be encouraged and strengthened through the promises of Jesus Christ and that your spirit would be present, sanctifying us always. We offer these prayers to you as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Freely we have been given to. Freely let us give. It is time to share the fruits of our labors with the Lord. Should you wish to make a contribution to the church, you can do that by visiting the church's website or contacting the church office and speaking with our financial secretary, Cindy Riddle. in the morning when the world was begun and I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun and I came down from heaven and I danced on the earth at Bethlehem I had my birth dance and wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance and he and I'll leave you all wherever you may be and I'll leave
Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for the many gifts you have given us. We ask that you would receive these humble tithes and offerings that they may be used for your glory in this place and throughout your world. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you.